Last week, or not last week, last week was Grand Prix. Two weeks ago, like I said, I was talking about how Jesus isn't just a teacher, isn't just a good man, isn't just another person like us. He was fully God, that he's unique in that way, um, and that that sets him apart, and that he's the most important person for us to be in relationship with because of that. We don't just get in relationship with people we like or with famous people, though those things may happen, but we can be in relationship with God himself as we're in relationship with Jesus. But it says another side of that that it talks about in Scripture, uh, and I, I said that we'd talk about that this week, is that Jesus is also fully man. He's a human. He was fully in the flesh, just like us, and unique uh, from any other understanding of religion is that God came into the flesh. That We call that an incarnation. That's a big word. But God incarnated himself. He left heaven and came to be with us. And uh, this is what it says in John chapter 1 as it's describing a little bit about who Jesus is. It says the word, and when it says that, it's talking about Jesus. Jesus became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God came to be like us. God came to live in the flesh like one of us. And when you hear that, when you hear Jesus was human like us and not just God, what are some of the stories from Scripture, some of the things you know about Jesus that make you recognize he wasn't just God, he was also human? Anything that stands out to you from what you know about Jesus? Yep, he had relationships with everyday people. He did, people didn't have to be perfect to be around him. He went and he hung out with everybody and connected with them. Anybody else have an example of something Jesus did that makes you realize he was like us? I'll give you a hint. Does anybody know the shortest verse in the Bible that you've probably memorized? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus was moved with human emotion. Jesus got sad like we got sad. It says that that happened when his friend, because he had friends, his friend Lazarus died. And while he was mourning that alongside Lazarus' sisters, he was weeping, he was grieving, he was sad about that. Anything else that stands out? Some stories about Jesus that makes you understand he's like us. What happened, what was true about Jesus after he fasted in the wilderness for 40 days, before the devil tempted him, what was true? He was hungry. Like Jesus needed bread, food, and uh, to survive. He needed to, to feed his body the same ways we need to feed our bodies. Jesus was hungry at times. There's a, a number of those kinds of things. There's stories, some of which I'll just paraphrase, that remind us of, of Jesus uh, being human like us. When Jesus was uh, about 12 years old, uh, his family went and took a trip to Jerusalem, and when, when his parents were leaving Jerusalem, Mary and Joseph were traveling back with the big caravan of people heading home. They looked around, and Jesus wasn't with them anymore. They had lost Jesus. They had been going home from family vacation, and they left Jesus where they had been. And so Mary comes to Joseph and is like, hey, isn't Jesus with you? He's like, no, I thought he was with you. Well, we better go back. And so they have to go back and find Jesus. And so they go back and they find him. And some of us know the story. He was at the temple talking with a bunch of the teachers and rabbis there. But it says something about Jesus near the end of that story. After he has this conversation with his parents about how he had gone to the place where he knew he could connect with God. Where he knew he could connect with uh, what he called his father's house. Understanding God as his father. It says this about him in Luke chapter 2. Then he went down to Nazareth with them talking about his parents, and he was obedient to them. He had to learn to obey his parents. He had to listen to what his parents told him to do. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and then it says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus had to grow up. He had to go through the same stages of life that we've all had to go through. He had to have parents tell him what he could and couldn't do and where he should and shouldn't go. There were rules that they gave him that he had to obey, and that was a part of his life. It shows us again that, that he had this understanding of his humanity. He wasn't just God doing what he wanted at any moment. He was flesh. He was human. He was fully man. We see there's times where Jesus goes to the temple later in life. He's in his 30s. Uh, his young 30s, and he goes into the temple, and when he gets there, he sees that what people have turned the temple into is a marketplace. 
And so they understood the Old Testament rules that had said that if somebody was coming to the temple and they wanted to make an offering to God, they had to do so with certain kinds of birds. Blemish-free, spotless, without stain or wrinkle kinds of birds. And so people would come to the temple and they would get there and somebody would stand at the door and be like, ah, the bird you brought isn't good enough. You should buy one of the birds we have for sale. And they would make the price of those birds way too high. They're just trying to make money. When Jesus sees this happening, he's mad at the, what people have set up, the way they're buying and selling at the temple. Does anybody know what he does when he sees that, they, that he's, they're doing that? He's super mad. He turns over all the tables. He flips over the tables. Some of them says he takes out a whip and begins to whip the, at the people to make them scatter, to drive the animals out of the temple. It says in scripture he does that. Because he's angry. Jesus got mad at things. The way we get mad at things. And that anger came out of him. So much so that as he's leaving that experience. And he's walking away with the disciples. He looks off and he sees this fig tree. That isn't growing fruit the way he wants it to grow fruit. And so he curses it. Like in his anger and frustration. About the way the temple's been treated. He starts to curse at some of the trees as well. We see when he does that, that he's also God, because when he curses a tree, it like withers. And when we curse a tree, it doesn't even hear anything. Uh, I don't know, it doesn't have ears. Uh, so it just stays there. But, uh, but he gets these kinds of emotions. There's a number of stories that talk about how Jesus was betrayed. And he feels betrayal. About how Jesus was misunderstood. At one point he told the disciples that he was going to have to die. And Peter's response was, I'll never let that happen to you. As long as I'm around, you won't do the thing you just said you need to do. I won't let you. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You're misunderstanding everything I'm here to do. He somehow was misunderstood by people. We don't get to see it as often in our English Bibles uh, because the translation issues are... Um, are not as clear, but Jesus made jokes. Jesus told jokes when he was teaching about who God is. Now, some of you have maybe heard the story. He's teaching some of the religious leaders of the day, and he's confronting them because they think they're doing everything good and right, and Jesus is recognizing that they miss some things. And so he's telling stories, and two of them stand out. But the people in the first century, when they heard them, they would have laughed. So Jesus says something like, uh, you keep taking the speck out of your brother's eye while there's a plank in your own eye. Like you're trying to get the little speck of sawdust out of somebody's eye and you've got this big, huge two by four sticking out of your head. Like your priorities are wrong. And we hear it and then we're like, oh yeah, that's a big thing and a small thing. He's making a point. But the people would have thought, that's such a weird exaggeration of an illustration. They would have recognized he was joking and they likely would have laughed. He similarly at one time says, you're so much trying to keep yourself pure, you're trying to obey the law enough to keep yourself pure, that you've gone down to the place where you're trying to strain a gnat out of getting in your food. Gnats are like these super duper small little insect bugs. And he says, you're so careful that you're trying to strain a gnat out of getting in there. You want to stay as clean as you possibly can, but you're somehow missing it because you're swallowing a whole camel. And we, again, we hear that and we're like, little bug, big animal, I get it, he's making an object lesson. But we don't get how much of a joke it is, because in our language, that doesn't rhyme, but in Hebrew it does. Like when Jesus is speaking and, and telling stories, it's actually probably in Aramaic, that particular teaching, uh, Greek or Aramaic, when, when he says the, the you're, you're straining out the gnats but swallowing the camels, it would be more similar if we said, uh, you're keeping out the mouse but you're swallowing the whole house. Like there's, there would be a rhyme to it. People would hear it and be like, oh, this isn't just, just a serious teaching. He's making a point, but he's making it in a humorous way. Jesus would tell jokes as he preached and taught the people. We see that Jesus forgave. He recognized that the people would hurt him and that part of his response to that was to try to remain in healthy relationship with them by forgiving. That's something it says God does, but something that we're supposed to do. That's supposed to be part of our, our human life is forgiveness. In all of the stories about Jesus, there are two of them that I turn to the most. There's my two 
most consistent stories in scripture when I'm frustrated with the world, when I don't understand something about what God's trying to do in my life, when I'm uh, sad, uh, when I feel like I'm in conflict with somebody, two stories that I run back to uh, that, that remind me of who Jesus was and how I can relate to him in his uh, humanness. And the first is a time in John chapter 6. Jesus has been teaching uh, the people of God, and he says some language that's really unique. It's language about how he's God. He says, I'm the bread of life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. He finishes that teaching, and some of the people that hear it say, Jesus, we don't really like what you said. Your teaching is hard. We don't know that we want to do it. And they leave. Jesus came into a town and he had hundreds of disciples that followed him. And he teaches this thing about how people are supposed to recognize him as God and get sustenance and life from him. And when he says it, they all say, I don't want to do it. I want to do easy things and I want to do things my own way. And Jesus goes from having 120 or so disciples to watching 108 or so of them walk away. And he turns to just the 12 that have been most faithful. And he recognizes that the thing he has said is hard and that people might leave him because of it. So he turns to his friends and his disciples and he says, are you going to leave too? Because I know what I'm supposed to do. And it saddens me that friends and uh, disciples and followers will leave. But I have to stand by this. There's a time in my life when I was in high school. I had... Uh, grown up, I wasn't a Christian, but for whatever reason, the way my parents had raised me, I had known that it would make my dad upset if I got into partying or drinking or doing any of those kinds of things. And there was my senior year in high school, some of my friends started to do that. They started to spend their Friday nights doing those kinds of things. And they would invite me and I would say, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm kind of do other things. And after they invited me a couple of times and I had said no, they stopped inviting me, which meant we stopped seeing each other on weekends and started seeing each other just at school. And then they stopped coming over to my house as much because they had started forming new friends in other ways. And I, I had this moment where all of a sudden I realized I lost most of my friends because of the thing I thought I was supposed to do. And I see Jesus having this, I know what God says is supposed to be true. And even though they think it's hard, and even though it's not what they want, they'd rather do something easy. They all left them. And he feels this frustration and sadness that people are missing out on making the right kinds of choices. And so there's been times in my life when I have this like, man, I feel alone. And I recognize Jesus felt alone. Man, I feel like I have to make a hard decision that might not be popular with everybody. And I look and I see that Jesus had to make hard decisions that weren't popular with everybody. And I, so I, a lot of times, resort to that kind of uh, scripture and run back to that story. The other one I run back to far more often is on the night of the Last Supper. The night that Jesus ends up uh, being arrested and going to trial. There's a moment between those two things. Jesus has finished the Last Supper. And he's getting ready uh, to go to trial. And he spends some time after the Last Supper in a garden praying. And he goes to the garden and he brings his disciples with him. And he begins to pray. And when he begins to pray, the disciples all fall asleep. So Jesus is praying by himself. And he's praying because he knows that the plan God has is for him to go to the cross and to die for us. But there's this moment where Jesus' humanity comes out in this prayer time in the garden. And Jesus begins to pray that he wishes God had a different plan. So he says, God, if there's any other way you could do this. He uses a language talking about this cup that he has to drink. And so he says, if there's any way that this cup could pass from me, let's do that instead. But, if this is your will, I'll do it. And he prays that, and he goes back to find his disciples, and he finds that they've fallen asleep. So he gets mad at them and wakes them up. And he says, couldn't you stay awake with me for at least an hour? And then he goes back to pray again. And when he goes back to pray again, he prays to God a second time. God, if there's a different way, if there's any other plan, if you could do something besides my body being broken, my blood being shed, me dying on the cross, I would love it for there to be some other thing that could happen. Take this cup from me. Remove this from me. I don't want to do this. But not my will, but yours be done. 
And it says that an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Not takes away the problem, not takes away the heartache, not takes away the sadness, not gives another plan. It says the second time. And being in anguish. Jesus is frustrated. He's uh, stressed. It says he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He was in not disobedience with God the Father, but he was in this understanding of uh, wanting a different plan from what God the Father had planned. His humanness said, I know this is going to hurt. I know this is going to cost me something. I don't want to do it. Lots of times in my life, I've identified with that humanity of Jesus. Whether it's because something my parents want me to do or something God wants me to do, there's this, this understanding. Here's what it's supposed to look like. And you say, but if I was writing the plan, I'd write it different. If I could be in charge, we'd do something different. It wouldn't require suffering. It wouldn't require pain. It wouldn't require saying no. I'd be able to be popular and do all the things I want. I would be able to, I would be able to disobey. If, I, if it's just what I thought is best, I'd be able to do it. And Jesus identifies with that and yet show, and shows us that humanity. And in the midst of that, shows us the perfect example of what we're supposed to do. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And the challenge and hope for us is that we would recognize in our humanity, we can identify with Jesus. We're tempted. We feel anger. We feel sadness. We feel frustration or anguish. We get hungry. We weep. We feel like we're abandoned by friends. And yet in the midst of that, Jesus says, but that happens in my life because I'm standing on the principles of God. And that happens in my life where I say that even though I would plan it different, I understand that God's plans are best. And so if he doesn't have, if this is his plan, not my, what I want to do, but what he wants to do should be done. And so we get the privilege of saying uh, we recognize and relate with Jesus because he's experienced everything we've experienced. And yet we model our lives hopefully after Jesus and say, and even when it's hard, even when the humanity part of us wishes everything was different, we'll do what God wants us to do. And Jesus is awesome and that we get to be in a relationship with him as God, but he's also awesome that we get to identify him within a relationship as just a human like us. And that's the unique thing about Jesus is that he's both of those things at the same time. And the hope is that we would recognize we're created to live that way too, fully in the flesh and fully spiritual at the same time. We have the image of God inside of us. We're not fully God like Jesus was, but we were created in his image in a way that we can stand on his principles because of what he's the spirit he's given us. And so I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray that that would be true of us. And then we'll uh, go into the gym and join the Sparkies for some game time. God, we recognize uh, how good it is to have Jesus model what being God in the flesh looks like. But we also recognize how good it is to be able to understand more about who we are as we see it in Jesus. That we can get angry and frustrated and afraid, be misunderstood, be in anguish. And yet through all of that, while we experience all of that, we can still stand firm in who you are and follow and obey you well. And we pray that we would do just that. That we would, in our humanity, follow and obey you well, even if it's different from how we would have planned it. Help us to do that in ways that only you can. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.